Okay, let's get started. Um, Ted usually does in introduction, but I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of myself. Jason Lone, I'm an associate research professor here at Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley. Um, I've been here about five years. Uh, before I'll well, start at the beginning, I got my uh, PhD at University of Maryland College Park, electrical engineering. I've worked uh, at IBM, um, worked at Google, uh, I've worked at NASA over here, and uh, uh, I also work at uh, my startup company, which I'll tell you a little bit about at the end. Um, and uh, most of my research over the last couple of years has been in antenna optimization. Um, this is the idea of finding high-performance antenna designs that uh, solve problems that people care about. Um, anybody, show of hands, anybody know how antennas work or delved into antennas before? Okay. Amateur radio? Any amateur radio? Hams? Okay. All right. Good. Um, <clears throat> antenna design is a really interesting uh, domain to do search algorithms in. Um, there's so much of it that is uh, sort of a black art. Um, even uh, experienced antenna designers who have been working in the field for 30, 40 years, there's always some element of the design that um, you may not quite understand, and uh, I'll talk about that in, in one of my later slides. So what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, strange at high performance uh, AI designs um, for antenna systems. Um, the primary technique we use in, within AI are these things called evolutionary algorithms. Um, this is the idea of breeding antennas, so taking a mother antenna and a father antenna mixing them up in some special way and coming up with children antenna and hopefully the children are better than the parents. So that's in a nutshell what I'm going to talk about. Um, just some acknowledgments. Uh, one of my, two of my close collaborators, Derek Linden and Greg Hornby, have been involved in a lot of, a lot of the work that you'll see. Um, anybody know who these two gentlemen are? What's that? Hertz? No? Darwin, yes. Anybody? Gentlemen, going once, going twice. Okay, um, Maxwell. So um, these two esteemed gentlemen, um, some of the biggest names in science, uh, actually lived in around the same time and uh, also around the same place, Edinburgh and, and Cambridge. Um, why do I mention them? Well. We're going to take their, their uh, discoveries and uh, inventions and combine them in when we use evolution to make antennas. But uh, Tale of Two Cities, uh, Darwin in 1825 uh, studying medicine in Edinburgh and 1847 for Maxwell philosophy and then in Cambridge 1830. Uh, Darwin was in the clergy, and Maxwell was uh, studying mathematics, 1854. Um, uh, they have a lot of uh, things in common. Um, scientific peak around the 1860s. And there is even um, some uh, possibility that they can, uh, wrote letters to each other um, around that time, although it's not really clear that they uh, met. They were certainly aware of each other. So pretty interesting. And we're going to take evolution and uh, electromagnetics and combine them in, in the uh, work that uh, research that I've done. So let's talk about antenna design automation. Uh, automation. Why is antenna design hard? Uh, these things called evolutionary algorithms, can they help? And mention a mission that I worked on. So uh, what is an antenna? Uh, it's just simply a transducer. It's going to transform a wave from space into electronics and then back again. They are reciprocal devices. 
they, if you have one antenna, it can do the transformation into space, put launch a wave into space. It can also take a wave that's in space and um, put it back into the electronics domain. So very simple concept, um, uh, but a very complex uh, technology uh, when it comes to designing them. Um, so in antenna design, uh, as I alluded to, is somewhat of a black art. And it's uh, very time and labor intensive. Um, there's, there's a lot of complex issues. It's Like I said, it's not really clear sometimes why bending metal in a certain way does what it does. And it requires uh, you know, significant experience. It's hard for an undergraduate coming out of a great school like Carnegie Mellon, uh, even, even from Carnegie Mellon, to be able to, to design high performance antennas uh, in their first year after uh, studying electromagnetics. And if you want to know about electromagnetics, you can just look at these four equations here. This is, these are Maxwell's laws. Um, that's it. Everything is here. Um, but taking this and going from this to the antenna <clears throat> on your iPhone um, is a tricky thing. Um, and uh, requires a lot of, uh, of experiential knowledge. Um, you really can't solve, you really don't solve these when you're doing an, an antenna design anymore. You're, you're basically using numerical methods inside of a $50,000 piece of software. Um, and you never want to underestimate bending metal in a chamber. Sometimes you just, serendipity can rule the day. Um, you bend the antenna the right way, put it on your network analyzer. It's like, wow, this resonates right where I want it to resonate. Um, great. The other thing is a lot of antennas, especially cell phone antennas, are actually designed by someone in Asia with a pair of tin snips cutting copper strips of copper tape. Um, for example, the handset is nearly done. They have the four or five radios in the handset, and now it's time to put the antennas down. So what's left in terms of space inside of the, the back case of your, uh, of your antenna handset, of your, your phone. Um, well, somebody cuts out little strips of copper tape and says, OK, I could put an antenna here, and um, puts it in the chamber, tests it. Oh, it, it gets pretty good efficiency. OK, that's, that's the Wi-Fi antenna. Uh, now let's do the Bluetooth antenna. Let's do the uh, cellular. Let's do uh, NFC. Um, this is how it's, it's done. Now, that's an exaggeration. You, you, you don't have the antenna. You, you don't have the handset pretty much all built, and then you do the antenna afterward. It, it comes earlier on in the process. But you get the idea that you can do a lot with just cutting little strips of copper tape <coughs> and uh, designing antennas that way. So uh, we call it technosery. The less you know, the more it's like sorcery. And the more you know, the more it's like technology, but you just never really get rid of the sorcery part of it. You just know better you know, what you don't know. And this, you know, uh, some famous guys from Lincoln Lab, MIT, um, really good antenna designers, they'll, they'll all agree to this, because uh, you can understand Maxwell's laws, and you can understand um, a lot about how certain antennas, but then you get a new problem, and they need circular polarization and a wide bandwidth. And why does that work? Uh, we try to understand it. Um, yeah, and just some points here about if you try to understand it all uh, before, you can get uh, you can get left behind. Um, because in practical antenna design, um, it's what works that rules the day. Hey, you know, that, that design worked for that application. OK. Um, if you want to spend uh, weeks and months trying to understand why it did, you know, you, you'll get left behind. Intuition helps, but it can also sometimes be wrong. Um, there's a famous case of uh, helical antennas. Um, these look like corkscrews. Um, a, uh, a gentleman named John Krauss at Ohio State uh, invented this helical antenna. And um, 
uh, based on his intuition, he did it in his basement, and he said, you know, I think this is going to be really good for, for launching circular polarized waves. Um, a Nobel laureate came to town to visit his lab and said, oh, why are you wasting your time? You know, it's obvious that the wave is going to cancel out and there's going to be a lot of uh, destructive interference. You know, don't waste your time on this. Um, so even somebody um, quite smart can have the wrong intuition. It turns out helical antennas are used all over the place. Lots in spacecraft, on cars, um, they're, they're very common. Um, they have a lot of nice properties. The, in terms of, a, in a computer science perspective, designing antennas, the kind of the, um, the, it's a very complex problem if you look at it sort of just mathematically. And I'll show you an example of, of that. Um, just a little background on uh, the history. This work started in the mid-90s, um, and people have applied these these things called evolutionary algorithms um, since then. And why are, is, are, is it a good domain to apply um, these algorithms to? Well, basically, we don't go through all this, but the black art thing, the fact that you can get a high fidelity simulator, and the fact that you can exhaustively test. Let me talk about that one first. Um, if, you, uh, if you use a neural network, if you have a complex neural network that does something, you know, somewhat smart. But you look at it and you have no idea why it does something smart. Are you really going to trust that to a commercial product or to something that goes in space? You really can't understand why it's doing what it's doing. Um, with antennas, even as bizarre as some of these antennas look, you can exhaustively test them. So you can ship them as a commercial product with, with confidence. You could put them in space with confidence. Because the nice property, you just spin that antenna around 360 degrees and 4 pi steradians, you get everything that that antenna will ever do, all the inputs, all the outputs. Um, it's a really nice property. The other thing about I'll mention here is for those hams, I mean, you, you've probably heard of NEC2 or NEC4. These simulators have been around for ages. They're open, some of them are open source. They're high fidelity. They work quickly. So you can do a computer intensive method like the evolutionary algorithm on, uh, on, the, on the antenna design. <clears throat> this is a very simple, you don't have to know anything about antennas, but you're going to see on the next slide why it's a hard problem. For those of you who do know something about antennas, um, we're just trying to design the length of this reflector element and then the distance between where this is where the current comes in and there's this, this is called the driven element. So we're just trying to parameterize the space in terms of this distance and this distance to get a certain gain pattern. This is what the search space looks like. <coughs> we have length down there and separation here. So what you can see here, this is the best point here, right up here. It's right over at a, a pretty small length and also at a small separation. Um, but it happens to be also next to the very worst point in the search space. <laughs> so if you, if you don't have a smart algorithm to search this, first of all, you might kind of like surf along here and get to a point here and say, oh, this is probably the best, the optimum, because I'm at a peak, and there's every, every direction I go is worse, so I'm going to stop there, or I'll stop there. That, so if you don't have a smart search algorithm, you're not going to find that point. Or you might search around here and say, oh, you know what? This is a bad neighborhood. I'm going over here and search elsewhere. So you need some smarts in your, in your search algorithm to, uh, to solve this problem. Um, just some uh, some more of the history of, of electromagnetics uh, and, and antenna design, especially. So the late 19th century, we had the beginnings from Maxwell to um, uh, Altschuler, Krauss, and uh, Yagi. Um, basically, all the antenna design work is all done manually. It's all there's a lot of serendipity. The example of the helix antenna, for example, then. As you know, the computers started becoming more mainstream, 
people wrote programs to simulate electromagnetics. And then we had uh, CAD tools. And this was still more in the mode of trial and error. You could actually, but you could simulate it now with actually having to bend metal. Optimization came in in the 90s, improved tools. And then uh, what I like to say is synthesis is the unexplored domain in antenna design that has not um, been looked at. And that's some of my research. Um, just a three step process, uh, three types of uh, antenna design that have been, we've seen over the years the traditional design of sending, getting requirements in, coming up with the design, iterating, simulating, compared to requirements, and you do this loop. And you come up with standard designs. And then a semi-automated process is where you can uh, let the computer do some of the design work for you. Uh, again, you start with requirements and go through uh, an initial design and put it into an optimization and get something out. Um, the third one uh, I'll talk about later um, is the synthesis thing. So who's heard of genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms? OK. Um, real quick, this is just uh, basically an algorithm modeled on Darwinian uh, natural selection. Uh, you're basically breeding things to have good properties. So this could represent, and each one of these could represent an antenna, could represent uh, the shape of an air, uh, airplane wing, um, whatever you're trying to optimize. It could, it, this, these could be rules that try to predict the stock market, for example. Whatever you're trying to optimize, that's we just show these as these different colored boxes. You're going to take them, you're going to randomly generate these. That's a key thing about these are uh, stochastic algorithms. We're, we're using a lot of randomness. These are randomly generated, uh, say, airplane wings. You evaluate how good are they at, at lift and drag, minimizing drag and so forth. Select parents. You get your two designs here. You swap bits and pieces of them. And hopefully, there was something, this was something, this red piece here was, was, was some part of the antenna or the airplane wing that did something really good. And this green part was also, from the other parent, did something really good. So you're going to get a better um, solution than either of these. And then that solution will go will propagate back into here and you go on and on the idea is that you keep getting more and more of these high performance uh, designs um, this is a little uh, little video of of it I don't want to spend too much time on it but you can see what's happening here is we have our let's say our antenna designs here they're represented by just green and uh, red bits and what the algorithm is doing is is it's taking, it's breeding. This is where the, the breeding is happening. And there's some random mutation that happens over here. But these, again, these can represent whatever you're trying to optimize. You pick two, possibly uh, breed them, um, add some randomness to it, and put them back into the population. This is all, um, this is all that's happening inside the algorithm, swapping pieces and doing uh, adding some noise to the solutions. Um, these algorithms um, are very compute intensive, so we use the cloud. This, this, was taken, this picture was taken a long time ago when uh, I had my own servers, but it's much more cheaper just to go to Amazon EC2 and just rent these out. Uh, and nowadays, that's the way we do it. But this is what it would look like, whether it's uh, you have your own server or you have uh, a cloud server that Amazon hosts, you're, you're, you're using a lot of CPU cores or GPU cores. Um, I usually show this to more of an antenna audience, but does anyone want to take a guess which ones were human designed and which ones were computer designed? Any of our ham friends want to uh, take a guess? Upper left, the one all the way in the corner? 
That's human design. Uh, which one? This one? That is a computer optimized one, yes. And the other one is this one here. <clears throat> but you can see this is a human designed antenna, uh, um, sinuous spiral. Um, I mean, look at this interesting. This has got curvature here, it's got curvature here. Again, another human one. Um, this is common in cell phones. It's called a PIFA antenna. Uh, here's our helices. Again, another human designed one. Um, but you can see, uh, here's a fractal antenna, uh, also human design, this one here. So, uh, and there's all sorts of names for these antennas. Uh, there's, you know, ram's horn antenna, bow, bow tie. Um, you know, there, I've always thought there should be a book that just shows, you know, the beauty of an, you know, the beauty of antennas, and just have pictures of these crazy shapes that people have come up with. Um, uh, you know, over the the decades. So um, this was the first application of using an evolved antenna, um, and this was called uh, NASA's ST5 mission. This was three nano satellites, uh, basically about the width of a keyboard, um, that went up in space in, in 2006, and we uh, we just as a test problem we were just looking at trying to. Uh, see if we could come up with an antenna uh, that would work for this, and we didn't even um, even actually actually expect to build anything. We were just doing this as a as a nice little problem. Anyway, this is the um, this is the actual text from the requirements document, and um, we pulled out of this the important antenna um, parameters that we would feed into our algorithm. Um, Transmit and receive frequencies, obviously very important. So this is X-band, if you're an antenna person, uh, 8.4 gigahertz to 7.2 megahertz, uh, gigahertz. Um, gain, impedance, uh, and uh, a, ge a geometric constraint needed to fit inside of a six-inch cylinder. <coughs> so our, our goal, our, our kind of test was to see if we could take this list here feed it into our algorithm and get an antenna that could, met, could meet those specifications. And um, prior to our work, um, a very good antenna engineer in New Mexico had designed this antenna. This is called a quadrifiler helix antenna. Um, this is what it looks like, actual size. And uh, it's a very good antenna for this problem. Um, what you can see here is the uh, this is the radiator, and then it just sits on top of a, a ground plane, and then it's mounted on some standoffs. Um, but underneath this, there's a, a lot of complexity. I don't know if you can see this, but you can there's there's a lot of circuitry, and there's a, uh, a, a fee, uh, the feed comes in here, but it's split into 90 degree quadrature here. So there's a lot of circuitry inside the board, inside the layers of this board. So it's pretty complex and lossy, i.e., it, it it has a lot of inefficiencies. There's another picture of it. <coughs> so our goal was to again take that take those requirements, put it into our system, and come up with antennas. And this is our J optimization system, and we came up with these antennas at the first uh, within the first couple of weeks. Um, I have one of them here. This is the actual size of the antenna. This one here, so you can see it. Um, so this antenna, what's that? Um, so this is the, this is the actual size of the antenna here, um, and we call it a branching design because it has these little branches. You can see. It's got an arm that goes like this, but then it has a branch off of the arm. Whereas this one here doesn't have any branches. It just comes straight out. It's just one piece. No branches come off of it. Yeah. I don't know if this is a good time for the question. It's not good to be holding it. But, um, do you 
do any kind of sensitivity analysis of the brain area in it. Because I look at that and I look at how tiny that is and I go, well, that's a big brain. They give you a really great design as long as you can do everything to the tenth of a millimeter accuracy. Yes, I've got that. I'll, I'll talk about that. There is a sensitivity analysis that we do. So, um, ah, reminds me of, uh, you know, people say this pretty pretty often, bent paper clips, antlers, and so I put some waves coming out of it, but, uh, uh, and you'll see some more antennas that even have more uh, paper clip nature to them. But um, I'm not going to go through the algorithm in detail, but I'll just give you a little taste for how, what happens in it. The evolutionary algorithm really doesn't know anything, just like natural selection doesn't know anything about cheetahs and gazelles, right? It's just a mechanism to make populations better and better, right? Our algorithm doesn't know anything about electromagnetics or antennas, but what it does know about are these little computer programs that you see here. Forward, rotate X, forward, 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 rotate Z, forward, rotate X, forward. What that, that little program does is it, think of it like a cursor that gets moved to positions as you execute those forward and rotates. Go back, go up, go back, go forward, go forward. So this little computer program draws an antenna, although it doesn't know anything about electromagnetics. It's just drawing a, a, a three-dimensional uh, wire structure. That's all it knows. Um, Later, this thing will get put into an antenna simulator to see how well it radiates. But the algorithm doesn't know anything more than uh, than what uh, than these little little uh, programs, little little antenna constructing programs. More details, which I'm not going to go in. More details. <coughs> this fitness function is is interesting, and it'll answer your question about the sensitivity analysis. Um, and this was way back when, when we used to call cloud computing, you know, Beowulf clusters or whatever. Um, but what we do in terms of sensitivity analysis, we're going to take each antenna design that the algorithm produces, and we're going to um, create three uh, additional ones that have noise on them. So each dimension, each uh, angle for the bend has noise on it. The length of each segment has noise, so that's how we that's how we actually build in this kind of sensitivity insensitivity to manufacturing. We uh, we we add noise to them. This is the fitness function. This is BSWR, which is a measure of impedance gain, and then there's a penalty score. But basically, all we're telling the algorithm to do is. Um, we're telling it what a what a high performance antenna is. You want low visoir, so if your visoir is up here, you get a high score, which is actually a bad score. But as you bring the VSWR down, you know down is good. You get better and better scores. And if you get the the desired VSWR, you get a perfect score. Similar thing happens with the gain, and um, that's what that's the uh, the signal that comes back to to the evolutionary algorithm to tell it what are good antennas. Um, this is a um, this is an uh, measurement from this for this antenna taken at a, an antenna chamber. And the reason I show it is because you can see all this ugliness over here and here and here. Why is the why is it um, if you're not an antenna person, basically what's happening here is this is like the antenna goes dark. It's really, you know, this is minus 30 dB. This, this is like you can't hear anything from the antenna. You can't get any signal out. You start getting signal out, you know, up, up in this area, you know, around here. But why is, why is that ugly there? Isn't that a bad thing? Well, it turns out that evolutionary algorithms are, are kind of dumb. If you we told it to ignore everything from here over. So when the evolutionary algorithm ignored it, it all just went bad. We also told it, ignore this, uh, these angles here. And that's why the pattern is bad there. And that's why down there, too. 
we only told it, just get get this line up from here to here. Just get, get it above zero and try to get as high as you can. Try to get up to five if you can. And everything else was don't care. So that's why the algorithm um, has produced an antenna that has some ugly parts to it. But that was part of the requirements, so um, all well and good. So on this chart here, this is the uh, quadrifiler. This antenna here gives this performance. It's supposed to be in this yellow box, and you can see it doesn't really quite do that. And then this antenna here gives in this box, because we told the algorithm you needed to be in that box. Um, so even though the human designer didn't actually quite completely nail it, um, it turns out that this was this was really the more important part that, rather than down here. So this antenna was still acceptable. Uh, there is no feed network. Yeah, I'll show that to you in a second. Um, then NASA ran out of money for this mission. And instead of going all the way out here, they had to go to uh, just low Earth orbit. So instead of GEO, they had to go to LEO because they couldn't afford a rocket to take you. Couldn't, couldn't get a ride out to uh, the GEO. So that changed everything. <coughs> it changed the pattern a little bit. Um, this antenna has is very silent, straight overhead. So this one wasn't really going to work. Has a deep null at zenith, so really no way to keep this uh, design. However, um, because we used a computer-based method, we could just turn on the fire up the computer again, rerun it, and get some new designs, and that's what we did. First, this was a problem, but then we realized this was a feature of our system because we could just rerun it. So then, within four weeks, we came up with these guys. And I'll show you what it looks like here. This is the uh, this is one of the antennas. Uh, it's actually this one here, um, mounted on a ground plane. And for a uh, a uh, model that you can walk around with and show people, we have it here too. Um, so this antenna. Uh, is very different in the sense that it's only got one branch. There are, all of these antennas are monopoles, but this one actually only has just one branch on it. And the nice thing, uh, there is no feed network. You just put your cable, your SMA uh, coax, attach it there, and you're done. It's just a solid disk, and that's it. This is what it looks like as the algorithm is running. Um, like I said earlier, the algorithms start out with random antennas, and then hopefully the breeding process produces better and better ones. And what you see here is that the uh, what evolution is discovering is that having a little bit of a corkscrew is actually a good thing. Is getting better and better performance. Indeed, if you just look, you look straight down on this one, you can see that it's it's. Uh, Kind of going like this if you look at it. Um, I'll pass this one around. Take a look at it. It is trying to be slightly helical. So again, this is this. The cool thing about this is that we didn't tell evolution that you needed a helical antenna. It figured it out itself, creating this semi-helical thing, and uh, the antenna worked. <coughs> this is just showing. This thing mounted uh, on the spacecraft uh, mock-up. Um, this is the field pattern. Now, the reason I show this is because a lot of people will say, oh, that's such a crooked-looking design. The pattern must be kind of crazy-looking. Well, actually, it's actually quite smooth. And um, uh, you, know, you can see the red means high gain, and the yellow means lower gain. And the requirements wanted most of the gain out here, but still a little bit up at zenith. And uh, so this very crooked shape gives you a very smooth 
almost like a, a beach ball pattern with a little dimple at the top. Now, one of the nice things about this design is because it's just a straight connector right in, uh, as opposed to this, this has a lot of uh, inefficient circuitry. There's power being lost inside this circuit, whereas this one is just straight through to the, um, to the radiator. So you get, if you put two of these, these antennas, you get 38% 38 efficiency. And if you put two of these antennas, you get 97% efficiency. So very nice. Your spacecraft will stay up longer. Your, um, your cell phone will last, your battery life will last longer. I mean, basically what this, this efficiency is, is the RF power going into the antenna, how much of it goes out into space or you know, into free space, and how much of it gets, is heating up the circuit board, right? That's what antenna, you know, I didn't say this before, but that, I mean, that's what antenna design is fundamentally about, is getting the energy to go where you want it, right? And not avoiding losses, avoiding sending it in, into the wrong place, or um, the cable heating up, or, or feeding back into your radio. This is just a picture of the flight unit. Uh, mounted on the, the actual spacecraft, <coughs> and um, you can see there were three three of them, three satellites. The black ones are the evolved ones. So they're they're uh, potted in one of these radomes, so you don't you know you don't you can't see the antenna inside of there because it's sitting inside one of those. So I have a video here. See if it works. Complexity is limited and requires significant expertise and experience. The Evolve Systems Group at NASA Ames Research Center tackled a challenging antenna design problem for NASA's Space Technology Advisor Mission. They've come up with computer programs that searches for superior designs by repeatedly taking the best antenna designs and using them as guides to breed new ones. Thirty-five network computers running advanced evolutionary algorithms, generating hundreds of thousands of antenna designs. The survivors go on to produce ever higher performing populations, leaving but a few superior designs. Evolutionary antenna synthesis has the potential to design better and less costly antennas faster than before. The evolved antenna is currently undergoing tests that will tell if it is qualified to launch with three satellites on the Space Technology 5 mission in 2010. If successful, this evolved antenna will be the first evolved object to fly in space. See if we can get the. There we go. There's another video. That, so that obviously was the first antenna that, uh, and it, it, uh, this one didn't fly. It was the one that I showed you uh, later. That flew. Um, this is a little. Um, this one doesn't have sound. This is just a little, uh, little uh, ana computer animation of. It's not showing. Huh. Interesting. You know what? We'll just skip it then. You see it? Oh, let's see if it works now. No, it just wants to go blank on me. Okay, that's fine. 
this this will uh, this will show you what the, that 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 can that's a that's a still from the uh, animation. But anyway, the you know the satellites are sitting up here, and uh, it's a Pegasus it launches from the uh, underbelly of the airplane and shoots into low Earth orbit. And uh, these guys, these um, satellites, they fling out like like frisbees. And the mission was very successful. And uh, so, what what can we take away from the this mission is that well, these these uh, strange looking uh, antenna designs actually can can do some very uh, good things in terms of uh, being faster to design, getting higher performance. Um, you can see some of the things here, the lower power and more uniform coverage, inexpensive design cycle. And then the, uh, this other thing that kind of came at the end was uh, when they changed the orbit and the requirements changed, we were able to rapidly redesign uh, the antenna. Um, this is just a side by side of the evolved and the uh, human design. Um, these are some of the other, since that mission, this is some of the other evolved antennas that I've worked on. Um, another one of those crooked wire ones, um, Yagi type of antennas, antenna arrays, reconfigurable spirals, and uh, a bunch more. In fact, um, this antenna here. So this antenna here, uh, can we make it a little dimmer? Um, this one is actually uh, going to go to the moon in uh, spring of uh, 2013. Uh, that's the plan anyway. And we did this one uh, for, uh, again, for NASA. Um, there's, and there are a few more going up. Uh, on another uh, mission. One of them is called Laddie and the other one is called uh, Iris. And uh, X-band, this is S-band, so it's like 2 gigahertz. And the other one is uh, X-band and S-band. So um, this is just showing some measurements. And again, this antenna has the strange shape, but you get this really smooth pattern. Um, so the natural question to ask is, okay, so how does it do it? How does this strange shape produce such a smooth gain pattern? Um, the best, so I'm not an antenna engineer. I uh, just play one on TV. Um, this, uh, the best we can figure out is that um, the antenna is, the evolutionary process has tuned each of those lengths and angles to somehow self phase the antenna. Um, can't explain why that is, but uh, <coughs> from an engineering perspective, since you can exhaustively test it and the thing does does work, um, you may, you know, you can leave that as an exercise to the, to the reader uh, to figure out why it, it does that. One thing that it does do that we do have um, noticed about these antennas. If you see that first bend is parallel, comes up and then it goes straight, goes parallel. You can see it right there between my fingers. That parallel is something called a tuning stub. We didn't tell the evolutionary process to, to do a tuning stub. It naturally found that. What that does is it gets the match right, the impedance match right. Um, so uh, this antenna actually has the same thing the one that I passed around. The first bend is going horizontal. It's a specific length to get the match. Um, so this last one that I didn't show you before is basically we'd like to see this research result in antenna synthesis where you have requirements coming in and antennas coming out. And this is all part of the, the magic and the algorithm, the search algorithm. Just have this all automatic and uh, go from requirements uh, to design. And uh, there's a, a tool that um, I'm in the process of commercializing uh, called ADOS, Advanced uh, Antenna Design and Optimization System, um, that is trying to do this kind of lofty goal of 
antenna synthesis completely automated. So you just put some your requirements in and you get designs out. This is one of the prototypes of that um, tool. You put all your band information, your geometry, your environment, um, your antenna types, and then the 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 run button is down there, and it uh, hopefully can design an antenna based on what you've you've entered in the other areas. So, um, uh, actually, part of the the tool is it does it does run in the cloud. <coughs> it's, it comes uh, it comes to the engineer uh, in a web browser, and uh, partly because of the, all the computer requirements that are needed. Um, in the background, we don't want to tax, you know, your laptop or your desktop machine with running these these really large compute jobs. So it it's a very natural fit to cloud computing. And this is what one of the uh, output screens look like. It <coughs> this will only be appealing if you're an antenna engineer. You see the uh, the antenna. <coughs> the Smith chart giving the impedance gain, and then the uh, principal plane cuts. Basically, antennas are measured in a spherical pattern, and these are just slices through those um, uh, balloons and beach balls and so forth. So that's all I want to talk about. Um, be happy to take any questions. Simulator are you using? We use Ripple D. Is that a method of moments code? It is a method of moments code, yes. Yeah, very fast, very accurate. Um, it's the really the only true antenna code out there. All like HFSS and CST and all the all the other ones are are more microwave codes that added antennas later. Um, or if they didn't add antennas later, they there's more money to be made on the microwave side, so they put all their development into the microwave side. Okay. So yeah, I mean I have some passing familiarity with MEC2, mm -hmm. which is of course kind of an old and crusty code and a yeah. lot of a lot of known bugs. So yeah. So uh, I guess the code you're using doesn't have issues with step sizes and funny wire angles and all those other issues. Very few. There's there's a few little gotchas in it, but it's we've we've been working with it for so many years we know where all the pitfalls are and how to avoid them. Yes. Yeah, have you found a way to optimize antennas and mobile devices given the limited size and practical? Yeah. Um the the this techniques that I showed you could be used for any antenna, sure. spacecraft, a handset, you can put into the tool uh, the geometry. So let's say the next generation iPhone, they're going to put the antenna inside, and they only give you a certain weird shaped cavity. You could put that weird shaped cavity into the tool and say, okay, give me the best antenna that can work in that, you know, you know, two centimeter by one, you know, oddly shaped volume. So it may not be a copper strip around the outside. Right. Completely different. Could be completely different. In terms of uh, like a smartphone, what they really all you know Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh, all they really care about is efficiency. They really don't. I showed you those smooth beach ball patterns where it radiates equally in, in all these different directions. If you're Verizon, you don't care about that. You what you care about? Can you get? Um, say 40% of the RF energy available, can you get it out into space, anywhere? Bumps, wiggles, warts, whatever. It doesn't, they don't really care. They just really want to get the um, as much out. They want it somewhat omni, but if it has bumps on it, they don't even they don't even look at it. They don't really care. They just want to know what kind of efficiency you can get. Um, which is why uh, you know the uh, they can get away with thinking of the antenna as an afterthought almost, because they're pretty sure they can get, you know, the uh, the Apple is sure they can get the efficiency that 
AT&T requires to be on their network. So they don't have to really do uh, a lot of, they don't have to do pattern shaping, basically. Any other questions? Yeah, I had one. I don't know if I'm pushing the right thing here. Uh, what? Yeah, the, the light is on. Oh, sorry. Okay. The, um, the generic algorithm that you use is like it goes, I mean, a lot, all these antennas look very similar. They got a straight segment and a curve, a straight segment and a curve. And just as you said, it looks like they're almost trying to make a helix shape. Mm -hmm. But is that an is that an artifact of the genetic algorithm that you're using? Because it looks like you look forward and then turn x, y, and z, and turn x, y, and z is what I'm out. Can it make a gradual curve? Maybe a curve, and then you change the radius and curvature or something like that. It can. So the yeah, the can question is, can it, yeah, you we've actually programmed them to do curves in the past, Bezier splines and stuff like that. Um, you know so much. Um, you know. Uh, it depends on the application. Sometimes it does help, sometimes it doesn't. For these, the uh, the segments, mm -hmm. you know, piecewise linear kind of curves were fine. But yeah, you know, you could certainly, we've done that. We've used splines in the past. Yes, sir. Uh, well, <clears throat> given that you've got some successful antenna designs for certain kinds of hacking, so change people back and sort of uh, reverse engineer it? And these kinds of pixels behind why those designs work so that you can then uh, either improve your algorithms or perhaps improve the kind of design? Well, yeah, I mean, there are, there are we've, we've looked at them, we found the tuning stub thing. Um, you know, in terms of uh, it, in terms of really trying to understand the detail about like individual bends, I don't think anyone's really done that. You can, you mean, because it's such a, you know, the, the waves are launching from each segment and they're bouncing into each other. Um, no one's really looked at that level, but certainly the tuning stub and the, any helical shape, those are two intelligible things you can extract. But humans already figured out tuning stubs and humans had already figured out that a helical shape is good when you need circular polarization. So if the question, is has the algorithm discovered any principle, new principle? No. It hasn't discovered any new principles that would, would help uh, you know, a traditional antenna designer. Um, but the reverse of that is that it has discovered what humans have discovered you know, all by itself without any, without telling it to try to do the, you know, the tuning stub and the, the helical shape. Which is interesting. There was something in the news recently, a, a system called Eureka from Cornell. And uh, it's a genetic system, an evolutionary system that can discover the laws of uh, physics and nature um, without being told, you know, that Newton's, you know, F equals MA or, or things like that. It, and that, that's, that's kind of what's happening here is like it's figuring out what humans have figured out. And then a, a colleague of mine at Stanford has done um, analog circuits. John Coza has done analog circuits where his system has produced uh, circuits that have been patented, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So it's so to call this these these algorithms an invention machine is actually not is a little bit a little bit of hyperbole, but it's actually not too far off. Because it is inventing things that that uh, humans have invented. Yeah. Um, it's maybe more for you. I saw while you were talking, I saw a box about five minutes ago pop up saying, "Anybody there to relay a question?" Does that mean there's a question ah. inside, or what does that mean? Oh, uh, Art. Um, is there anybody there to relay a question? Let me see if I can uh, scroll down and see what you. I hear you, says Art. Go ahead. I will relay your <coughs> question. Let's see. You can't. It kind of pops up. So let's see if, if Art has a quick. Does anyone else have a question while Art is. Any other questions? So yeah. you, you, um, you showed earlier your genetic code. Um, oh, is he ready? 
Yeah, um, I'll take his. So, um, can you deal with mechanical size constraints? Absolutely. Yeah, um, geometry is a is is a thing that most people really care about. Smaller is better. Um, make it small and break the laws of physics is what we get. You know, there is this rule about you know once you get to a tenth of the wavelength, it gets really hard uh, to uh, for an antenna to uh, to get the efficiency up to pull in the signal. But um, uh, yes, so the art, the answer is yes. You can. Um, we do this routinely and have done it routinely. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when you were showing your uh, your genetic, uh, I don't know what you call it, your DNA. Um, it was it move, rotate, uh, mm -hmm. three different rotations. <coughs> but I presume that's the kind of code you would use for one of your bent paperclip style mm -hmm. antennas. So, so yeah. What about for a patch? Talk, yeah, the patch antennas, the Yagi's. The, yes. The, all of that so we we on. handle those in it with a different uh, encoding, a different chromosome, if you will. So like a, a PIFA antenna, um, you could. Uh, well, I'll uh, let's see if I can uh, show you somewhere up here. Uh, I'll show, could just show it to you. Well, I guess not. Oh. Yeah. So, for example, um, like that PIFA there. Um, you could parameterize. Uh, you could parameterize each of these distances in the PIFA and let the algorithm figure out what they should be while keeping the general shape of the antenna. So, uh, in fact, that tool that I showed, that ADOS tool, handles uh, PIFAs in just that way. So, so there's kind of a process of taking the class of antennas and. Deciding what are the interesting parameters here that we would want to yep. have in, in, the, in the code yes. string. Yes, and that's what we're busy doing is adding all those antennas to the tool and figuring out how to parameterize them, like slots, rings, Vivaldi's, um, uh, spirals.